the evening Calvary Chapel Concord. Yeah. Another opportunity, Lord, just to come and, and just to worship Him, to praise His holy name, to learn of Him and grow close to Him. I um, also want to ask you guys to pray continually to uh, for, for Dottie, my wife. Um, she's really in the thick of it with the COVID. And uh, it's got a lot of symptoms that are, are just attacking her. And I uh, just really covet your guys' prayers that you could uh, just continue to lift her up, that the Lord would just touch her and, and take it away. Let's pray. Father, we just come to you, Lord, and we are so thankful for your love and, Lord, for your grace and for your mercy. And, Lord, we just ask God for your mercy upon Dottie right now, Lord. That, Father, you would just touch her and touch her body. That, Lord, you would rebuke the virus, Lord, that's attacking her, Lord. That, Father, you would strengthen her, strengthen her immune system, Lord. Let it respond just miraculously, Lord, with your touch. And we just pray, God, that you would uh, help her to get through this, Lord. That, Father, you would just quickly and rapidly, Lord, just ease the, the intensity, Lord, of the symptoms she's experiencing. And, Lord, just bring health back to her. And we just lift her before you, Lord. And we just also just want to Lift this time that you've given to us, Lord, to worship you. And ask, God, that you would guide us and lead us by your Holy Spirit. That, Father, your Holy Spirit would just anoint your message, Lord. That, Father, you would just draw us close through it, Lord, and, and in it. We love you. We praise you. We pray for all those others that are fighting the virus, Lord. Fighting any kind of sickness, Lord, or any kind of... Uh, struggle, Lord, physically and spiritually or emotionally. And we just pray for your touch in our life and upon our life. And we ask God for your blessing. And we ask you for your favor. Not because we deserve it, Lord, because of your goodness uh, in just giving it, Lord. Go with us now, Lord, as we worship you and praise your holy name. But we ask it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. You are my love, my 
of Judah who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave from every people and tribe, every nation and tongue. He has made us a kingdom of priests to God to reign with the Son. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Is he worthy of this? Is he worthy? Thank 
sanctified by glory and fire. Just as I am, empty handed but alive in your hand. Majesty, Majesty, forever I am changed by your love in the presence of your majesty. Majesty, Majesty, Majesty. found me just as I am, empty-handed but alive in your hand. Majesty, Majesty, forever I am changed by your love. In the presence of your man.
never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. Cause you are good. Lord, I come, and I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the
Savior's name, thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray, find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin left us crimson stain ye washed it white as snow Lord now indeed I find thy power and thine alone can change the leper spots and melt the heart of stone Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. For nothing good have I, whereby my grace to claim. Wash my garments black in the blood of Calvary's land. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. For the throne, I stand in incomplete. Jesus died, my soul to save, my lips just a repeat. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow.
to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No time Father, we thank you so much for this precious time in you, Lord. God, we can decide to do this, but we know, God, that it's by your strength and power that we stay by you, God, because we are so prone to wander. Lord, we feel it. This flesh, God, it calls constantly. I pray, God, in Jesus' name that you would help us to put it down that we would die, Lord, to ourselves, that we would live to you, God, that you would be our master, that we would bow at your majesty, that we would walk in the fear of the Lord, God, that as we walk, we would know that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit and we walk on holy ground. God, that we would ever be so in love with you that we would, that to hurt you by sinning, Lord, would, would just kill us, Lord, that it would just wipe us out. Father God, we need you. We need your strength. We need your power. We need your grace. We need your love and mercy. And we love you for each of those things, Lord. We thank you that you're our good shepherd and you bring us by these still waters, that we get to come and fellowship with you. What a privilege and honor. Lord, we're in awe of you, Lord. We're just so in awe. Thank you, Jesus, for this time. Open up our eyes and hearts that we would hear from you, Lord, and bless you and glorify you in Jesus' precious name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Love one another, guys. Love, love, love. You want to say something? Yeah. Say something. Why is this? Did you get from the giant? Hi, Carrie Chapel. Okay, good evening, everybody. Happy Wednesday. It's, praise the Lord. The, um, for those of you who've been pray, praying for rain, you got, got your prayers answered. And evidently, it's going to rain for another few days. Yeah, yeah, don't, no more rain dancing. <laughs> but we need, we need the rain, so, which is nice. It's nice to have rain. Rain's good. What'll happen is after it rained for a while, then people are going to start praying, oh, stop the rain. You know, nobody's ever happy. I mean, <laughs> okay. 
tonight, tonight, Pastor is going to uh, be teaching us from Genesis chapter 49, and it's Jacob's uh, last words to his sons, and he's going to be uh, blessing his sons, and, and back in the Old Testament when they did that, the, the blessings were from through him, through God, through him, because they, they came to fruition thousands of years later, you know. So, anyway, so I'm going to read this. It's, um, I think he's doing chapter 1 to 22. So we'll just read until he comes here, ready. Okay, and Jacob called his sons and said, Gather together that I may tell you what shall befall you in the last days. Gather together and hear, you sons of Jacob, and listen to Israel your father. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. Unstable as water, you shall not excel, because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it and went up to my couch. So you don't want to hear that, you know, when you, if you, you're getting a blessing from your father, and he says you're not going to amount to nothing. Anyway, uh, Simeon and and Levi are brothers. Instruments of cruelty are in their dwelling place. Let not my soul enter their council. Let my let not my honor be united in their assembly, to their assembly, for in their anger they slew men, and in their self will they hamstrung an ox. Cursed be their anger, for it is it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scattered them in Israel. Now we go to Judah. Judah, you are he whom your brothers shall praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He bows down, he lies down like a lion. And as a lion, who shall rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. Binding his donkey to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine, he washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. Okay, so we'll stop there. And Pastor will go through all the all the brothers and all the blessings and curses and everything else. Okay, well let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can gather together and worship to still as a free country we could do that. No matter what the things are coming down the pike. We do praise you and love you and thank you for all that you do for us. Please anoint the pastor tonight as he teaches us from your word. And pour out your Holy Spirit upon all of us that are here and those that are online and those that are going to hear the, uh, the message later on. And we do praise you and love you and thank you for all that you do for us. We don't deserve anything, but you just love us and pour out your grace and mercy on us. I praise you and love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, continuing our time through Genesis, we're in chapter 49 tonight, verses 1 through about 22. Lord willing, thank you. So we've been following the life of Joseph, sold as a slave by his jealous brothers. We watched his life get worse as it ended up in prison. Uh, unjustly, not in a fair way. But after the day came when he interpreted a dream of Pharaoh, he ended up becoming the prime minister of Egypt. We saw a more important turn of events as Joseph eventually wound up saving his family from the worldwide famine. Now at this point, Joseph's been reunited with his father and the family in Egypt. But Joseph's father's life is coming to an end. And so Joseph is called upon to visit his sick father. And this is what we looked at last week. Jacob blesses Joseph's sons, 
Manasseh and Ephraim. Joseph was chosen to close the eyelids and give the parting kiss goodbye to Jacob. The blessing has been given, last chapter, to Joseph. I will make you fruitful and multiply you. You will have descendants as the dust of the earth. And Jacob also blesses Joseph's sons. And Jacob declares that Ephraim and Manasseh will be counted as his, as his kids, thereby receiving a full portion of the blessing. And Jacob switches them up when the blessing comes so that he switches the hands. And Joseph really brought his attention to this and Jacob said, no, it's correct. It's how I want to do it. It's what I want to do. And so now the patriarch, a patriarch Jacob is nearing the end of his life. Um, last week we, we looked at the special blessing he put upon Joseph and Joseph's sons. But now Jacob, what he's going to do is bless and prophesy over his entire family. And so verse 1 says, And Jacob called his sons and said, Gather together, that I might tell you what shall befall you in the last days. That phrase, in the last days, is used 14 times in the Old Testament. Each time dealing with prophecy. The things that Jacob will be speaking about speak of the future in this chapter. Some of the things are going to refer to what will happen as they come into the promised land. Some will refer even up to the time of the end. And so what we see then with Genesis chapter 49 is really one of those incredibly rich passages that deals with future events. And so Jacob went on to say, verse 2, gather together and hear you sons of Jacob, and listen to Israel, your father. You sons of Jacob, again, the flesh, and Israel, your father, governed by God. On his deathbed, Jacob gathers his 12 sons all around him, and he speaks to them concerning what lies ahead for them. And even though he will begin with Reuben, Jacob won't address his sons in their birth order. He's not going to do that as would actually be the customary way of giving out such a blessing. But instead, we're going to see Jacob address his sons in a way that will portray the history and the future of the nation Israel. In other words, Israel is going to go through different phases, and we'll see a few of them here tonight. But they align with how the order of the blessing goes out to the sons. In other words, this is an error, if you would, a period of time where God was doing things in Israel, or actually Israel was doing things a certain way. And it it aligns with the meaning of the name of the son that is being given the blessing at that particular time. It's pretty cool how the Lord puts that together. And so Jacob, addressing his sons in the way that portrays the history of Israel. Reuben, verse 3, you are my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength the excellency of dignity, and the excellency of power. However, you're unstable as water. You shall not excel because you went up to your father's bed. Then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. And this is a reference of what Reuben had done 40 years previously in Genesis chapter 35. When if you remember following Rachel's death, he had relations with her handmaid, Bilhah, through whom Jacob had fathered Dan and Naphtali. It's possible that Reuben thought he had gotten away with all of this. But here all of a sudden, 40 years later, it comes back to bite him. And Jacob said to Reuben, you are my firstborn. You had every opportunity, but you're unstable as water. And what you did 40 years ago has caused you to be less than what you would have been had you not partaken in that sin, which is true really of each and every one of us. Had we not done certain things, it's limited us in the development that God 
wants to bring about within our life. Maybe the way in which perhaps he wanted to use us. We can maybe look back on those times and thought, if I had only done it this way. But in the phases that we talked about, Reuben speaks or represents the earliest days of Israel's history. The earliest days of Israel's history. And what you see there in those days is a disappointing people. A people who have disappointed the Lord as they committed spiritual fornication while Moses, if you remember, was on the mountain getting the word of the Lord for them. And so disappointed was Moses that you remember he came down and he threw the tablets down and broke them when he realized that just like Reuben had done, Israel was at that point also unstable as water and acting in a similar way. Unstable of water, that word speaks of a recklessness, like a boiling or an overflowing water tap. Water isn't so easy to control. We saw that when the dam up in, uh, uh, oh, where is it? Oroville broke. And just erratic, if you would. It doesn't certainly control itself. It just boils over and destroys everything. And so the lesson here that, that is for Reuben's learning and for anyone who would pay attention is that of self-control. Reuben working through this in his own life and beginning to understand the failure that comes along with that. And so here's one that would normally be in first place in terms of inheritance, in terms of blessing, but his lack of self-control kept him and kept that from taking that place that was to be properly his. It would also ultimately affect his family as well. The tribe of Reuben came from this man, this man that was without self-control. History tells us that no prophet, no judge, no heroes in the Bible ever came from the tribe of Reuben. And there's a reason for that. As it goes back for that, he, he's attributing it to here at this point, that lack of self-control, of being able to control certain areas of your life. And we know that each one of us struggle with that, right? From one time or to another. And yet here he is addressing it. And there's lots of areas. I, there's not just, I mean, a lot of times we, we look at certain things and we say, oh yeah, well that, okay, that's where you're going with that. No, there's a lot of areas where a lack of self-control can hurt you. Sexual sin is one of them. And that's what Reuben's problem was. The Bible clearly shows to us what that relationship or that part of a relationship where it's to be at or confined to, if you would, in his design. It functions best when it's in the atmosphere of a man or woman who are committed to each other for life. And so outside of those boundaries, it's called immorality. And it's a broad word that can include things like sexual sin or before marriage or homosexuality, any number of those things. It's just about anything that we don't want to be imagining. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and in verse 18 through 20, you know, Paul gives us the instruction of flee sexual immorality. And every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and you are not your own? For you were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Samson is another one that would fall into this category. He was a man who was used greatly by God, and yet he was ruined in this area of his life. But it's not just sexual sin either. It's drug and alcohol. A lack of self-control can really truly manifest itself. If you don't have self-control, you're basically an addict. Can alcoholics change is a question that's oftentimes asked. Can they overcome their addiction? Uh, Seattle, uh, not long ago, well, some time ago actually, uh, their downtown emergency services center, they didn't seem to really bite into the fact that alcoholics could change and stop being addicted to the substance they are addicted to. 
And so what they did is they elected to spend $11 million on permanent housing for homeless alcoholics. And the Seattle taxpayers were fed up with spending $50,000, they estimate, per alcoholic every year on recovery programs, prison, and, and emergency room visits. And so their solution was the 1811 Eastlake Housing Complex that accommodated about 75 alcoholics. And the residents, this is what, honestly what they did, the residents were allowed to drink all that they want. You check in, you go to your room, and you can drink yourself to death, literally, is what they, they figured that nobody is able to be changed. Nobody's able to, to be reformed, if you would. And so go and drink all you want. You don't have to be in a recovery program. As long as you're off the streets, you're good. And the program's executive director, a guy by the name of Bill Hobson, believes, he believed most alcoholics can't change. That's what it's predicated upon. Once you're an alcoholic, you're an always alcoholic, he says, citing the example of an alcoholic who got drunk 10 minutes after leaving a detox facility that he had been in for two months. Hobson and his group reject the transforming power of Jesus Christ and believe some people are beyond hope and help. Do you think, I mean, do any of you think this is true? I don't think so. I think that we believe that God can change a person change his heart. But the question's out there, can a person addicted to alcohol or drugs ever change? I mean, has God changed you guys? I'm sure. Don't raise your hand, but, you know, gotten a hold of you and, and, and changed your life as it, as it relates to how you address the substance or behavior or something like that in your life. What about finances? We need to exercise self-control in finances. It's a dangerous thing if you Start acquiring credit cards. If you don't learn to control things, you can end up over your head, big time, in debt. What about emotions? For some folks, the issue is, uh, of self-control strikes at the way they handle their emotions. A person who can't rein in their anger is ultimately going to have a lonely life. They really will. They may be able to intimidate people to stay around them for a little bit or a while, but nobody wants to get close to a person that can't control their anger. What about school and work? You can't get by forever not doing your homework. It just doesn't work that way. Same principle applies when you join the workforce. If you can't discipline yourself to get your work done when you should, then you're not going to be surprised or shouldn't be surprised when other people are promoted over you or when they dismiss you if, even at the extreme. And so with these things that we struggle with, and each one of us struggle with, that lack of self-control or being able to control ourselves when it comes to these things, how do you develop it? And I think we go back to the same things, that the truths that, and the principles that the Lord has given to us in the Word. How do we control ourselves? How do we have and, and cultivate and, and develop self-control within our lives? Number one, the work of the Spirit. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, it says, But... The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and what else? Self-control. Against such, it says, there is no law. And so you see that self-control is one aspect of the fruit that the Holy Spirit wants to produce in your life. The kind of self-control that God is looking for starts by us yielding our life to the work of the Spirit, letting Him do what He wants to do in our life, waking up every single morning and saying, Lord, fill me with Your Holy Spirit. And Lord, bring in that self-control, which is the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love. It's demonstrated by these others, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, gentleness, and self-control. And so, Lord, what do You want to do with my life? It goes back to that same thing of how do we start? How do we focus on Jesus Christ? Do we keep the main thing the main thing? And is it Jesus Christ and Him crucified within our life? And so number one is the work of the Spirit. Number two, learn to be faithful in the small things. Faithful in the small things. Luke chapter 16, verse 10 through 12. And that's the training ground, really. A lot of people want to come in and just jump to the top. 
They want to come in. And, oh, I want to come to this church, but, uh, you know, I need to be the pastor. And it's like, well, well, wait a minute, you know, slow down a little bit. In Luke chapter 16, verse 10, it said, He, he who is faithful in what is least, he who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. It's almost like a training ground as, as you come in. You know, do you pay attention? Do you, do you commit yourself? Are you, are you committed? Are you loyal to what God has called you to do? You know, I've seen people that come in before and oh, I want to teach Sunday school or I want to do this or I want to do that. And they come in and they maybe do it for two or three weeks or maybe four weeks and then you don't see them anymore. And that's not the way it is God's economy. That's not the way that God does things. He says he who is faithful in the least is the one also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? And so self-control becomes then a key ingredient to faithfulness. Even though we see self-control being a work of the Spirit, it is also a result of what you and I choose to do. Faithfulness starts with that which is the least. That is, learning to be faithful in the small things of life. Because what will happen is that will teach you to be faithful in the larger things, the bigger things that Lord allows you to be a part of and partake in. It might be learning to save your money initially instead of spending it as soon as you get it. It might be learning to get up when the alarm goes off instead of sleeping in too late. Little things, just little things. And so the encouragement here is to start with the smaller things in life. And I find that when you grow in self-control in one area of your life, you affect the other areas of your life as well. It really does. And you can't, you're not, you can't be too old either for this, guys, in case you're wondering. Oh, I've been there, done that. Well, the Lord wants to do more. He wants to bring more about in your life. Second, S S Simeon and Levi. In verse 5, Simeon and Levi, they are brothers, but they're instruments of cruelty. And these instruments of cruelty are in their dwelling place. Let not my soul enter their counsel. Let not my honor be united to their assembly. For in their, and here it is again, anger, they slew a man. Again, having to do with self-control. So in their anger, they slew a man. And in their self-will, they hamstrung an ox. Jacob is talking about another specific incident in the family history. And that's in Genesis chapter 34, where it tells us the story about how Jacob's daughter, Dinah, was raped by the son of the mayor of Shechem. It was Simeon and Levi, you might remember, who organized and led the slaughter of the men of Shechem as a way of retaliating for their sister's rape. And Jacob says in verse 7, Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and I will scatter them in Israel. When Dinah, their sister, was raped by Shechem, it was Simeon and Levi who hatched this plan that would result in the destruction of the people of Shechem. Simeon and Levi speak of the next phase of Israel's history wherein we see a dispersed, a dispersed people that dispersed people. And for just as Simon or Simeon and Levi depended on their own plan to retaliate against Shechem, the nation of Israel began to depend on their own ingenuity, on their own alliances and their own treaties with other nations. The result of that was the Assyrians in 722 BC and the Babylonians in 586 BC would carry the people of Israel into captivity, thereby dispersing them throughout the globe. And so again, another phase in the nation of Israel. Neither the tribe of Simeon nor the tribe of Levi had a set independent territory 
when the land was divided up under Joshua. The tribe of Simeon was scattered within the tribe of Judah. The Levites, which became the priestly tribe, they were given cities throughout each of the other tribes rather than their own set territory. And Jacob says here that their scattering was due to their anger. How much grief our anger has gotten us into. How much grief, how much trouble it's gotten us into, our anger does. And the thing of it is, is that anger by itself doesn't have to be sinful. We read in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, it says, be angry and do not sin. And yet in our human limitations, anger generally is not a good thing. Would you agree? We kind of have a tendency to get upset and we see a lot of road rage now and, I mean, increase and people getting a little bit tense and fired up, especially with the COVID and the, all the things that have come along with that. But even before those things, anger was a problem. Getting angry with people is it's nothing close to that which God wants to produce in your life, what he wants to bring about. I've had people tell me that they got so angry with people because it was the only way that they knew how to get people's attention to what they were saying. So they get really upset and angry with them. I remember reading an article. You might remember the incident back in June of 2007. There was a minor league baseball manager in Mississippi, the Mississippi Braves, guy by the name of Philip Willman, and he threw a major league tantrum that earned him the national spotlight, even if it was only for a moment. During a losing game against the Chattanooga Lookouts, Wellman was infuriated uh, over a call that was made by the home plate empire. And Wellman, he charged out of the dugout. He stood nose to nose with, with the umpire. And he just began unloading. He began screaming. And then he framed his hands just outside of the umpire's face. And he shook him emphatically as he blustered all the more. Wellman then stormed towards home plate. He knelt down on one knee and he covered the plate with dirt. And then he retraced the home plate with his finger, this time about a yard wider. And then after a brief altercation with the third base umpire, Wellman actually stole third base, literally, pulled it out of the ground. And he pulled the bag out of the ground and he kind of sauntered towards the second base and he hurled it discus style into the infield. But that's not what, I mean, that, the thing that really got people's talking about this incident Walking back towards the pitcher's mound from second base, Wellman got down on his belly and he started crawling, writhing, if you would, towards the mound. And he picked up the rosin bag and after pulling an imaginary pin with his teeth, he lobbed it like a grenade at the home plate umpire. He then headed for the outfield and on his way, he uprooted second base, picked up the discarded third base and he took him with him. And just before he left the field via the outfield wall, Wellman blew a kiss to the cheering crowd. And it says Wellman's temper earned him a global recognition and a three-game suspension. The response from the fans was mixed. While some appreciated Wellman's theatrics as all in good fun, others were embarrassed by the example such behavior modeled for young fans. But raising your voice, letting your anger get out of control is not the way to motivate people. In reality, it will only lead to the same consequences of Simeon and Levi. That is dividing and scattering, dispersing people. And I've seen this happen in the workplace. You know, employees can't keep working for an angry boss. I've seen it happen in a home where families are destroyed because parents won't rein in their anger. And so how do you deal with that anger? The Bible has some instructions regarding anger. And in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31, it says, Let all bitterness, all wrath, all anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, 
tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ forgave you. So the Bible tells us in Ephesians 4 to put it away from you. Apparently what that means is that there's a choice that you can make with regards to your anger. You can hold on to it or you can let it go. The Bible also tells you to replace your anger. Not only put it off, not only let it go, let it get, get rid of it. It says put it away from you as the Bible says. But there's something else that tells you to replace it with. And what is that? Well, number one, kindness. Krestos in the Greek. The word also speaks of doing good things for others. But not just kindness. He talks about being tender-hearted. That is literally having strong bowels, being compassionate, tender-hearted towards one another. And this might include trying to put yourself in the other person's shoes so that you might understand perhaps what they're going through. How many times, you know, when you get cut off on the freeway and that person is just really, really making you mad, really making you angry, and yet how many times have you had, you know, maybe someone else in the car, like a wife or spouse or someone that says, well, honey, you know, what if they just got really bad news? Or what if they're just coming from being fired? Or, And it doesn't excuse the way that they're acting, but certainly it helps explain it. It also helps us to deal with it. And so tenderhearted. And then forgiving. You know, to show yourself gracious. How much better it is for us to show graciousness, if you would, and kindness and benevolence, to grant forgiveness and to give pardon. The word is the verb form of charis, which is grace. Give something that isn't deserved. God's riches at Christ's expense. The, the grace of God is receiving that which you don't deserve. Mercy is not receiving what you do deserve. And so in that form. And I believe that these words talk about just taking a positive step in the right direction. Doing something tangible in the direction of grace rather than just stewing in your anger. We've talked about it before, you know, the bitterness and, you know, better, you know, what, what you go through and what you experience, you know, in terms of conflict, in terms of contact with others and, and those things that really upset you. Are you going to let it be that which makes you bitter? Or are you going to come out of it better? Because you're learning these things, you're learning these principles and these lessons. Well, next in verse 8, he goes on to Judah. Judah. You are he whom your brothers shall praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. And so here you go, following the flow of these phrases. After becoming a disappointing people, okay, letting the Lord down, if you would, not that you could even do that, but being a disappointment, you know, don't grieve the Spirit of God. But not just a disappointing people, after being a dispersed people, there's all of a sudden some good news for Israel as they become a delivered people, as seen in the life of Judah. For from the tribe of Judah, their deliverer, their Messiah, would come. Here with his enemies at his mercy, the deliverer is seen as an invincible leader. And so this is the first son who receives a positive blessing. Judah shall praise, and Judah's name means praised. And so there's a play on word here with the blessing that Jacob is giving forth. He'll be a one who praises, and he shall bow down. Instead of Joseph being the one the family is going to bow down to, the prophecy that ultimately it's going to be Judah. And this wouldn't happen for another 800 years when a young man named David from the tribe of Judah was anointed to be king over the nation of Israel. But ultimately, we're told, every knee shall bow to the son of David, who is Jesus. And so Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He bows down. He lies down as a lion. And as a lion, who shall rouse him? And so here the deliverer is seen as an unstoppable lion. There's a name of Jesus that might be hinted to at here in the book of Revelation, chapter 5, verse 5, where Jesus is called what? The Lion 
of the tribe of Judah. The scepter, verse 10, shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes. And to him shall be the obedience of the people. The scepter is a staff that a ruler would hold. And again, this hints at the family of David, the son of David coming. And Shiloh, the word seems to be connected with uh, the word for peace or tranquility. It might even refer to a state of peace or it might be a reference to a person, the one who brings peace, perhaps the prince of peace. But here, the deliverer, he is seen as an unvanquished Lord. According to the historian Josephus, the scepter shall not depart from Judah until Shiloh comes. That was a phrase that caused the rabbis to run through the streets of Jerusalem screaming in anguish in the year A.D. 12. You say, well, why? Well, because that was the year that the Romans, who were occupying the land of Israel, withdrew or took away the ability of the Sanhedrin to give out capital punishment. And that was a big deal. You remember that they went through the whole thing. That's why they had to go to Pilate in order to get permission for capital punishment because they did not have the authority to give it out. And so here, at this point, having... And, and really the, the big deal about it, the biggest deal, I think, is that it, having capital punishment authority was a mark of a nation's sovereignty. And... Uh, you know, being able to have that ability to execute capital punishment. And so when this power was taken from them, the Jews thought that the scepter had indeed departed from Judah, that God had broken his promise to them. After all, Shiloh, our Messiah, had not yet come. But wait a minute, he had. For right in their midst sat Shiloh. Right in their midst sat the Messiah, Jesus, as a 12-year-old boy, astounding the teachers and the rabbis, with his wisdom in Luke chapter 2 and in verse 46. Verse 11, binding his donkey to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine, he washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine and his teeth whiter than milk. And so finally, the deliverer is seen as an uncontested landowner as he purchases property with his own blood. This could be a picture, a, a picture of prosperity. Donkeys would most likely eat grapes on a vine. And so you didn't typically tie them up anywhere closer where they could get in reach of the vine unless you had more than you needed and you wanted them to take care of some of them. But who else would wash their clothes with wine? That phrase, the blood of grapes, it reminds us of what Jesus said at the Last Supper that the cup of wine represented his blood, which would bring to them forgiveness. In a sense, washing of our life, a washing of it, according to Matthew 26, 27. Even though we see some sense, a greater blessing going to Joseph, the greatest blessing, however, uh, of the Messiah would go to Judah. And so we see a little bit more importance being placed upon Judah. Zebulon and Ishkar. Zebulon, verse 13, shall dwell by the haven of the sea. He shall become a haven for ships, and his border shall adjoin Sidon. Zebulon would have contact with sea merchants, even though the tribe was not directly on the Mediterranean, though it did border the Galilee. But they were going to have that contact. And in Zebulon, we see an exiled people. Forty years after Israel rejected Jesus, saying, we will not have this man to rule over us. The Romans destroyed Jerusalem. They also burned the temple. And the Jewish people were dispersed and scattered once again. And the name Israel was replaced by the name of her enemies, Philistine or Palestine, once again. Verse 14, Ishakar is a strong donkey, lying between two burdens. He saw that rest was good and that the land was pleasant. He bowed his shoulder to bear a burden and became a band of slaves. So the tribe of Ishakar, they settled on the fertile plain of Ezdralon and they were oftentimes subject 
to the invading army's attacks prior to them getting into the promised land. But Ishakar speaks of an exploited people. For although the Jews were exiled, they remained as stubborn and as strong as a donkey. Although they were scattered into virtually every corner of the world, the Jews prospered to such a degree that they were persecuted, they were blamed, they were exploited as seen in the, the uh, programs of, of Russia and the concentration camps of Nazi Germany. Um, the Black Plague, the, the, a lot of things that they uh, took the, the, the guilt for, the blame for, if you would. And in verse 16, uh, Dan, uh, Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent by the way, a viper by the path that bites the horse's heels so that its riders shall fall backwards. Dan, Dan speaks really of a, a poisoned people. After they are exiled, a snake will come on the scene, it says, that will poison Israel. And this is why, to this day, the rabbis believe that a false messiah will appear and will come out of the family of the tribe of Dan. As believers, we call this snake the Antichrist. Verse 18, I have waited for your salvation, O Lord. This heart cry of Jacob speaks of the fact that although ultimately the Antichrist will seek to destroy Israel, initially she will trust him and pin her hopes on him, but it's not going to go well. The name Dan, we know, means judge, another play on words. Samson was one of the judges over Israel. He was from the tribe of Dan. The tribe of Dan was also known for introducing idolatry to the nation of Israel. And so perhaps that viper picture was, that's what it was really all about. In verse 9, Gad, a troop, shall tramp upon him, but he shall trump, triumph at last. So in Gad, we see really a persecuted people because this, his hatred for Israel, it says, will be venomous. The Antichrist will lead worldwide persecution against the Jews. The Antichrist and the forces of Satan will mobilize the world, we're told, in the valley of Megiddo in order to destroy Jerusalem. But in the end, they should really be overcome themselves. The name Gad means troop or trump or triumph. And again, Jacob is pulling from the name as he pulls from the meaning of what that name means and he applies it to their life and what they have been partakers of. Gad would be one of the tribes, you remember, that settled on the other side of the river before going into the promised land. And as a result, they too were also attacked by invading armies all the time. They were hit first. Verse 20, bread from Asher shall be rich and he shall yield royal dainties. Asher speaks of the fact that even though the Jews will be a poisoned people and a persecuted people, they will also be a protected people as they, alas, recognize their Redeemer. And so God tucks them away in a place that he's prepared for them in the wilderness. Most people believe this is the rock city of Petra that where they'll be, and they'll be cared for royally. Asher would settle on the north coast of Israel, a land that's very far, fertile uh, far, farmland. Uh, verse 21, Naphtali is a deer let loose. He uses beautiful words. Naphtali speaks of a preaching people. And so after the Antichrist appears, 144,000 evangelists, 12,000 of them from each of the 12 tribes, they'll go throughout the world preaching the goodly word or the gospel. The greatest revival, guys, in all of history will take place during the tribulation because it is the destiny of the Jewish people to be a preaching people. And this is a picture of a free-running mountain deer, the tribe of Naphtali lived in the mountains northwest of Galilee. And then in verse 22, we come to Joseph. And it says there in verse 22, Joseph is a fruitful bough. A fruitful bough or bow by a well. And his branches run over the wall. Joseph, of course, speaks of Jesus. Fruitful means to bear fruit and again, that word fruit being used, and it's related here to Joseph. Last week in the blessing to Joseph's son, 
we saw fruitfulness running throughout the chapter. Now, looking at this family, and we'll just close with this, there's lessons to be learned. But one of the biggest lessons, I think, is what is the secret of satisfied life, a successful life? How does that happen? How does that come into play in our life? Rabbis and ministers, gurus and philosophers throughout history have attempted to answer this very question. The Bible, however, gives to us the answer very succinctly. For in Romans, I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 4, and in verse 11 we read, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. That's the key. All things were created to please God, including you and me. That's why the first component of the Westminster Catechism states that the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. So follow with me, guys. If we exist in order to bring pleasure to God, the question, I think, then becomes, how? How do we do that? And John 15, verse 8, it says, Herein is my Father glorified. Jesus said directly, that you bear much fruit. How is God glorified when we bear much fruit? And so when you bear fruit, you glorify the Father. And when you glorify the Father, you fulfill the very reason for your existence. And that brings us back to our text. At the end of his life, Jacob draws his attention and ours to his son, Joseph. And the first thing that we see is we see the reality of his fruitfulness. For in verse 22, the first part, it says, Joseph is a fruitful bough, giving forth fruit, if you would. Now, the Bible defines fruit in five specific areas. First of all, in Romans chapter 1, verse 13, Paul tells us that, number one, winning of souls is fruit unto God. So you ask the question, did Joseph win souls? Absolutely. He saved not only his entire family from the famine and the drought, but other people in the country. And so when you share with your family, when you share with your neighbors or your friends the good news of the gospel, saving them from the drought that's in their own souls and from the fires of hell, then you are bearing fruit that pleases God. So number one, the winning of souls. Number two, Romans 6, 22, holiness is identified as a fruit. Perhaps best epitomized by his fight from the advances of Potiphar's wife, Joseph lived a holy life. He did. In fact, he is only one of two major Old Testament characters of whom there is no recorded sin. Only two. And Joseph's one of them. So, holiness is a fruit. But not just holiness, tithes and offerings. Philippians chapter 4, verse 17. It identifies tithes and offerings as fruit. Joseph, Joseph gave more money, more than money actually in Egypt, he gave his life as a servant to Pharaoh. Number four, Colossians 1.10 tells us that good works are a fruit unto the Lord. Did Joseph do good works? Absolutely. He saved an entire nation from starvation by starving, uh, starving up goods to distribute when there was a need. And then lastly, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15, names praise actually as fruit. These are the different kinds of fruit. 
And when Joseph came to Pharaoh with the, the interpretation of Pharaoh's dream, he directed all praise to God back in Genesis chapter 41, verse 16. But these five areas, so evident in Joseph's life, they are summed up in a sixth New Testament rep, uh, uh, reference, if you would, to fruit. Where in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, it says, but the fruit of the Spirit, and we talked about this already tonight, is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. The fruit of the Spirit is love. And it's defined by joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. The fruit of the Spirit is love. That's why we give our money. That's why we lift our hands in praise. That's why we share with others. With all of these qualities flowing through his life, no wonder Jacob said to Joseph, you are a fruitful bough. Now maybe you're thinking, well, that's good for Joseph, but why should I be fruitful? Well, when you get a chance, look in Mark chapter 11. It says, and on the morrow, verse 12, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came, if happily he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. For the time of the figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And the disciples heard it. And in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. Why should you be fruitful? Well, because if we don't satisfy our Lord, so to speak, not only will we not satisfy anyone, but we won't even satisfy ourselves. Jesus went out of his way to teach there in Mark 11 a powerful lesson in cursing that fig tree. He was saying basically to the disciples, whatever doesn't satisfy me will not satisfy anyone. Listen very carefully, guys. If you're not living to please God, then your life may very well dry up at the roots from below the surface, from deep within. And as a result, you will experience an emptiness, a frustration, and a depression, and a lack of, satisf of satisfaction talking about satisfaction and how that comes about within our life. That is the reality of his fruitfulness. But there's also the reason for his fruitfulness. Why is it there? Verse 22, again, Joseph is a fruitful bow, even a fruitful bow by a will. Psalm chapter 1, verse 1 through 3 says this, Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law does he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he does is going to prosper. Again, in John 15, 1, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. That Greek word for take away is ero. It's the same word that John uses when he says, Jesus lifted up his eyes at the tomb of Lazarus. Ero is also used in Scripture to mean lift up. Therefore, in our Lord's analogy, the husbandman would lift up the branch which didn't bear fruit because the branches 
on the grapevine would sometimes grow heavy. And when they grew heavy, they would fall to the ground and they would get stuck in the mud. And that's just what Jesus does with us. When we're in the mud, he lifts us up. John 15, 2, every branch that bears fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. The Greek word translated purge is kathero, from which we get our word catharsis. Kathero means to wash, to cleanse. And again, in this analogy, the vine dresser would come by and he would wash the mud off the branch that had fallen to the ground. In order to amplify this, Jesus said, you are lifted up, washed off by the water of the word. And the key word there is word. If you abide in me, John 15, 7, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. And herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. Like Joseph, who Joseph's root, they went, we're told, into the well. If the word abides in you, then you will bring forth much fruit. Now, if I went out in my backyard and I cut off a limb from my lemon tree and I said, great news, hon, we no longer need to go outside to pick lemons. Here's a branch. We're going to keep it right here in the kitchen. If I told you that story, you'd probably go, are you losing it? You can't cut off a branch and have it bear fruit. Why? Because it has to be connected to the tree. It's as if Jesus says, the sap of the scriptures must flow from me to you in order for there to be fruit coming forth in your life. As I look at the lemon tree in our side yard and I see it bring forth lemons, I have never once seen the branches connected to the trunk struggling to bear fruit. It's not like the branches go, oh, come on, lemon, come on, come on out. No, it doesn't work that way. The branches just hang there. They abide. And the fruit is produced naturally. You might decide to be loving, to do good works, or to praise the Lord in your own energy. And you might be able to fake it for a couple hours, for a day, maybe three. But ultimately, you're going to come up empty. The only way to produce genuine fruit morning by morning and day by day is to hang in there. Abide in Christ. Hang in there. Allow the Spirit to flow to you and through you. Because fruit can't be faked very long. You've got to have the word of God in your life. And so number one, the reality of his fruitfulness. Number two, the reason of his fruitfulness. And number three, the result of his fruitfulness. What was that? Again, verse 22, Joseph is a fruitful bow, even a fruitful bow by a well whose branches run over the wall. So fruitful was Joseph that even the next door neighbors, basically all of Egypt, were able to glean from his life. Guys, when we are fruitful, not only are we fulfilled, satisfied, but our fruit extends over our own boundaries and it spills into our neighbors, our co-workers, our friends, and our family. That's what God wants. A life that pleases him. That's how you will be satisfied by living that life that pleases him. The key to satisfaction is so simple. Be a fruit bearer. Because in so doing, your life will be prosperous without question. Let the word of God abide in you. Have devotions every single morning. Read the word every evening. Get involved in Bible studies. Let the word fill you up. Plant yourself by the well of the water of the word. For if you do, God will be glorified. Others will be edified. And guess what? You will be satisfied. Amen? Amen. Anybody down for that? Are you down for that? Hey. Father, we just come to you, Lord. We thank you 
just for the clarity of your word, Lord. And I just pray that, Father, in spite of me, that, Lord, you would just give these truths, that they would sink and permeate so deep within each, each person that was here tonight, Lord. That, Father, the things that, Lord, you have shared with us, that you would, uh, Lord, just bring them back even as they drive home, as they go to bed tonight, Lord. May they just think on these things. And may, Lord, you just express and, Lord, give to them, Father, these truths, Lord. And not only that, but, Father, that they would not just be a hearer of these things, but doers of these things. That, Father, we could just grab a hold and wrap our arms around the fact that we were created for your good pleasure. And that the only way that we can ever be satisfied and fulfilled is by exercising, Lord, that principle, pleasing you in everything that we do. We ask, God, that you would just uh, continue now, Lord, as, as we come back next week, just to help us to understand, Lord, uh, as we close out chapter 49, you know, just the truths, Father, that you have laid out for us, the principles, the precepts, that, Lord, we could live our life in such a way that would glorify you. Father, we could see you, you your son, Lord, in, in the life of, of Joseph. And Lord, just the example that you've given to us. May we not just sit here and just hear it, but, but do it, Lord, in the power of your Holy Spirit. And it's not a thing where we got to, got to, got to, but we get to. We get to explore just the riches of your word, of your love for us, of, of this concept of fruitfulness. Lord, help us to be fruitful in our life. For Father, we ask it in your precious name. And Lord, just continue to be with Dottie. Just your grace upon her life right now. Touch her, Lord. And Lord, just keep her in the palm of your hand. And just make her will, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Love one another.